Our next keynote presentation uh, is actually a colleague of mine since his company acquired mine a little while ago. Um, this is Sam Lightstone, who is the Chief Technology Officer for AI Strategy at IBM. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Sam's gonna talk to us about the intersection of open source and artificial intelligence. So without further ado, let's go with Sam here. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Are you able to see my screen okay? Yes, I can see it. Okay, fantastic. And I'm gonna step off stage now. All right, uh, welcome everybody and, and um, thank you for joining today. And it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to speak at ApacheCon, uh, actually pretty exciting for me. And um, hopefully this will be of some interest to you. So let's jump into it. I, I want to talk today about this interesting double inflection point uh, where open source meets AI. Um, we are, living now at the brink of a new era. It's not always obvious to us because our lives haven't yet changed too dramatically because of it, but actually we're living at this remarkable inflection in, in inflection point in history. Some of you may know this man. This is Arthur Samuel. He was a research scientist at IBM in the 1950s. And I don't know what they actually paid him for, but he had a dream to create a, a system that could play checkers. And you may say, well, who cares about a machine that can play checkers in the 1950s? But actually, it wasn't just a game that could play checkers. He wanted to create a machine learning system, a system that learned from experience. And the more experience it had, the better it got. The more games of checker it played, the better it got. And he created this uh, machine learning checkers game, um, really the first of its kind. And he coined the phrase machine learning in 1959. In 1962, his machine learning checkers game played a regional state champion by the game of Robert Neely and won. And although probably nobody noticed it at the time, we can look back and say that was a pivotal moment in, in history where a machine beat a human, a human expert at a game of tactics and strategy. And Arthur Samuel was just one of many seminal thinkers in those days of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Other names are very uh, well known to all of us, Alan Turing, Herbert Simon, Marvin Minsky, uh, and others. None of those people, those seminal thinkers, those founders of machine learning and AI, probably knew what the story arc would be or the role that open source would play in all of it. But actually today, almost every industry that you can think of is being disrupted by AI. Um, I've listed just a few here, but you know, name, name your field of interest, whether it's a, an industrial topic or an academic topic, physics and chemistry and drug development, fraud detection, you know, weather forecasting, you name it. It's all being disrupted today by AI. Um, now, when, in particular, when it comes to Apache, Apache is really at the forefront of a lot of this. And at IBM, we're actually quite proud of our association with Apache. Um, starting in 1999, we helped with the formation of the Apache Software Foundation, contributing uh, thousands of lines of code to the original Apache web server. And since then, we've contributed to many, many projects. You can see here a list of some that we are very actively contributing to today. So um, Apache actually is at the forefront of a lot of this new era of AI and many of the foundational components in Apache make it possible to do AI today. Now I wanna talk about this inflection point a little bit and show you some data. What you see on the left is the growth in Apache project code that's related to data ops and analytics, machine learning ops, and so on. All the, all the machine learning related componentry and its growth on the left over the last uh, more than a decade. On the right-hand side, you can see the IDC projection on the AI business growth. Now, they're pretty strongly correlated. It's not a perfect correlation, but it's pretty tight. Now, you know, correlation does not imply causality, but I actually believe that there is more than just a correlation that's going on. It's actually a dependency. The growth in AI depends hugely on the willingness of the community to bring machine learning and, and, and data ops to the, to the world through a community process of open source. 
There is no domain of computer science that has that has been growing as quickly as the domain of AI has been growing since 2012. It's unprecedented. In the past 50 years, nothing has moved this fast. And the only way that we know how to move fast as a community is to work together. And the only efficient model that we know for working together on software is open source. That's why the open source uh, is so vitally important to AI. And that's why the Apache Foundation and all, all those components that we know and love, you know, Spark and MLlib and uh, Apache Parquet and Apache Kafka, you know, and Apache Arrow, all, all these, and, you know, and emerging packages as well, are much that are, you know, directly related to machine learning algorithms. All of this is not just coincidentally correlated. It's a complete dependency. AI can only move as fast as it's moving because of the open source community and the Apache Foundation is playing a tremendous role in that. All right, so let's talk about how we got here a little bit because it's a very interesting story. You talk about some of these foundational thinkers, you know, Marvin Minsky and Arthur Samuels and Alan Turing, all that was, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s. And in fact, when you look at a lot of the popular algorithms, then I've listed some on the left, machine learning algorithms and the deep learning algorithms, sort of dozens, if not hundreds of these machine, the deep learning algorithms uh, based on neural networks, deep neural networks. What's interesting about these things that you see on the left, most of them were invented in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the deep learning, a lot of it in the, you know, the foundations of it anyway, um, at artificial neural networks and back, prop, back propagation and so on in the 1980s. So what happened? What happened? You know, it's sort of a curiosity. This isn't new tech, it's actually old tech. How do we get here? Well, there are three things that happened to bring us to this moment in history. Um, the first was the rise of big data, which really happened um, in the early 2000s. The internet comes of age, uh, digital transactions become the norm. People start pooling data from their operational systems or transactional systems into larger collections called data warehouses and then data lakes. And all of a sudden we have digital data that we can start doing machine learning on. You know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there's a lot of data. In, there's handwritten data, there's typewritten data, there's no digital data, a very, very slim digital data. What happens in the early 2000s is we get this like huge increase of digital data. And that's incredibly important for the advancement of AI because these algorithms that we just showed previously are hungry for digital data. The second big inflection point that comes is the advent of low cost compute. In 1997, IBM creates a deep blue computer that beats Gary Kasparov at chess. It's got this big supercomputer, you know, fills half a room. Um, but today, today, you know, you've got a cell phone probably in your, in your hand or your pocket right now that has more processing power measured in gigaflops than the supercomputer that beat Gary Kasparov in 1997. More processing power than a 1997 supercomputer in your pocket. And for pennies, literally for pennies, you can log on to a public cloud and lease thousands of cores, I mean, the equivalent uh, of thousands of your cell phone for very low cost. So the processing power that's available to us now is incredibly, incredibly available, incredibly cheap, and you can just pay for it when you need it and so on. So that's a huge inflection because again, all of these algorithms are hungry for compute, whether it's CPU or, or GPU or specialized ASICs. But still, we don't hear too much until this third inflection point, 2012, which began with ImageNet. ImageNet was a, a global challenge that was started by um, a computer professor by the name of Fei-Fei Li, who is the Sequoia Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University. And she started this organization, ImageNet, where, where you know different research groups would show up and try their algorithms on an arbitrary collection, a large arbitrary collection of digital images and the challenge was, can your AI algorithm figure out what is in the image? You know, an image of a, of a boat, a broom, a cat, two people smiling, whatever. And then suddenly in 2012, a research group out of the University of Toronto, um, uh, really the research led by a, a grad student by the name of Alex Grabeski and his uh, supervisor, um, um, Jeffrey Hinton. And the two of them bring together this, this new algorithm based on convolutional neural networks that creates a quantum leap forward in the, in the result on the ImageNet challenge 
And all of a sudden, everybody worldwide, all the research groups wake up and they go, wow, wow, what just happened? Okay, so um, since then, the world has really taken off with AI at IBM. We're excited to have a very broad portfolio of AI technology. You know, I won't belabor the details too much here, but you know, we have we have tools, we have pre-built models, then we have uh, AI-powered solutions that are embedding the two lower layers. Uh, but the key point is this: it's all built on open source, and a lot of it from the Apache Foundation, whether that's Spark, MLib, and Kafka, and so on. Um, let me just share with you a few fun examples, interesting examples from IBM and other companies in the few minutes that remain. We've created uh, Project Debater, an AI system that can debate with human beings on topics of serious social consequence, not just, uh, you know, what's the weather outside? I don't need an AI to tell me that, I can look out the window. But to debate with human beings live, and it only needs 15 minutes to prepare on a debate topic. Amazing. You may have seen um, our AI in action at the US Open. Uh, fielding questions about you know tennis history and tennis great tennis questions of you know what was the greatest uh, rivalry of tennis players of all time and so on. Um, we're featuring our AI technology with Bloomberg's Intelligence Squared on their new That's Debatable program, synthesizing input for thousands of people on opinions on debate topics and summarizing them in natural language. Um, we're also bringing AI to ESPN Fantasy Football with our trade assistant. You know, use AI to get better, more intelligent trades of players on eSports. Um, those are some fun examples. And of course, we're solving important business problems as well across the industry. But all of it building on open source, building on componentry from the Apache Foundation that we're also proud to be strong contributors to. Um, I want to show you one fun example from um, a few... Um, a few creative uses of AI. Let's look at this first one from NVIDIA. Um, in this example, you're going to see, so we'll start with some images that are uh, real people. Have a look at these faces. You can tell these are real people. You can see elements of gender, elements of style, elements of age. You can see you know, they have some clothing that they're wearing and so on. These are real people. And these are photos taken from an online, um, online celebrity database. Now let's have a look as well at some people who were created, fictional people who were created after training on that database, generated images created by an AI called a GAN. A GAN is a generative adversarial network. These people are fake. They never existed. They're created purely by the GAN after training on the celebrity data set. You can see the same elements of age and gender and style. You can see every whisker on these guys' faces. You can see hairdos. And it's not just the faces. Notice that some of the people are wearing jewelry. You can see the little bit of the clothing that they're wearing and so on. It's really quite remarkable. And um, let's very quickly watch how the GAN is built up progressively over time. Now, it actually takes about 20 days to generate these kinds of images on high-powered GPUs. But we're gonna speed it up here into about 15 seconds for you. And uh, have a look at that image on the top middle. And after about 19 days of training, you get this photorealistic image of a, of a man. And it's really striking. If you were to see this guy's face in a magazine, you wouldn't stop twice to think that that was a fake. And similarly, as people are doing that for photorealistic images, people are doing it for artwork. Here's an example of Madame de Bellamy, which was sold at auction at Christie's about two years ago, um, created entirely by AI. And there's lots of these examples of AI creating music, AI creating poetry, and so on. So, you know, I hope this has just been um, a little bit reflective for you. The 1970s were the era of the mainframe where digital transactions became the norm. Then came the PC era and the networking era where we grew the developer community to over a million people. Um, now we're just exiting this era of mobile and cloud computing where we've grown the developer community to about 10 million developers worldwide. And we're about to enter, or just entering this new era of intelligence, over 100 million developers working on AI and building on the, the three previous eras of mobile, cloud, PC, and mainframe. It's going to be an exciting time, and it depends tremendously on open source, and Apache's at the, at the center of it all. So, uh, you know, buckle up. It's going to be exciting uh, for this next era of AI. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Sam Lightstone. Bye.
that was very cool. Thank you so much for sharing with us.